We want to bring in our Dana Kosloff because um, she has been working the story for hours now. Dana, I know you have been very close to the scene there. And while this apprehension, this capture happened many miles away, our understanding is from sources that they plan to bring this suspect back to Highland Park, to the police station, not but a few blocks probably from where you are. Yeah, it's not very far away, uh, Erica. And I can tell you, though, even with the suspect now in custody, things here in the downtown area of Highland Park haven't changed very much since we were informed that he, the suspect, was taken into custody. The streets here downtown are still closed off. There are still personal belongings littering the street. Uh, we are on Central, about a block away from where the suspect opened fire from the roof of that business. The only thing that has changed that we've noticed here is until the announcement of the suspect in custody, these officers here from Barrington, by the way, had their rifles in their hands. They were standing on guard four hours with the rifle in their hands. Now, eight hours went by, eight hours uh, s since the shooting occurred at about 10.14 this morning, again, about a block away from where we are standing. Eight hours that suspect was on the run. And as you mentioned, and as we've been talking about here over the last 45 minutes or so, he was taken into custody, you know, just north of here. And as you mentioned, expected to be brought back to the Highland Park Police Department. But one thing I have to wonder, and maybe I missed it, Chris and Erica, maybe this is something Phil talked about and I just didn't catch it. Maybe this is something Irv talked about and I di just didn't qu catch it. But I wonder if this will rise to the level of domestic terrorism charges, if this will be a Highland Park case, or if it will end up being a federal case and I'm sure that those answers will you know we'll hear about charges at some point if there are charges but we would assume there's going to be we'll hear exactly who will have jurisdiction and what type of case this will be as I mentioned uh, a little earlier some people have been walking you know streets still closed down some people walking to get their belongings uh, they're still not allowed through but officers helping some who can eyeball their belongings take them away but other than that it is still very lockdown here and we expect that will be the case for a very long time to come because investigators have to painfully painfully comb through the blocks here and look for any possible evidence as Phil was talking about they have to be very very careful so we can imagine it is going to take a day or possibly more to for all the investigators to go through everything they need to here to collect any evidence that they will need um, to help them with this case and also any video uh, that anyone might have of the suspect or of what happened or any still photos as well. So we can expect the scene here in downtown Highland Park, again, I'm at St. John's and Central, will remain locked down for quite the foreseeable future. Chris and Erica. Yeah, Dana, I believe we were on the same page because that is a question about the jurisdiction and domestic terrorism that we posed to Phil earlier and understanding at what point would federal charges potentially be coming if that is something they pursue or would it stay with Highland Park and Chris I know we have Irv Miller now to give some legal perspective. Yeah Irv can you answer Dana's question as far as charges here what is the uh, what's the runway here for what we should expect next. You know the way this typically works is uh, Highland Park has jurisdiction over him they have the body uh, the Lake County State's Attorney's Office is going to review it uh, they will hopefully uh, approve charges within the next 48 hours which is uh, the, the time limit they have on this particular uh, type of case and um, the case will be filed initially in Lake County uh, that's not to say that the feds can't jump in at any time in the future and uh, proceed with federal charges, but the way this always works, um, and I've been doing this for a long time, this will start out in Lake County, Illinois, with a Illinois murder charge, um, which in Illinois, as you know, we do not have the death penalty, but uh, it, uh, mandatory sentence in this case, if he's convicted and he is presumed innocent, uh, is life in prison. The difference between the Illinois statute and the federal statute for domestic terrorism is the domestic terrorism under federal law could carry the death penalty. Mm. And Irv, to your point, there there was a recent case uh, just within the last few years where that was a question that came up. I believe it was with um, a, a student at one of the local colleges um, where they questioned whether or not they should try to pursue the death penalty with those federal sentencing charges. Do you, how often do you see that actually happening, though? 
you know, it doesn't happen often. And, and the way it works in the federal system is uh, the, the local uh, prosecutor's office in Northern District of Illinois, the federal prosecutor, uh, doesn't make that decision. That's a decision that's made in Washington, D.C. by the attorney general or, you know, the deputy attorney general. And frankly, it takes time. But um, it's, there's no doubt in the, my mind that when he goes to bond court, either tomorrow or the following day, that there's going to be a no bond hold on him. Uh, and the only exception to a no bond hold would be if somehow he's injured, he's in the hospital and he can't be in court, then a judge doesn't have the authority in Illinois to impose a no bond order, but they can still set by the millions of dollars, which is in effect a no bond order. Uh, you know, Irv, I just want to make a point to our viewers. Throughout the day, uh, we were trying to figure out the name of this suspect. About three hours ago, two and a half hours ago, we learned the name of this suspect. We put his name and his picture on television because there was a search, a hunt for him and his silver Honda. Now, as the picture on the screen indicates, that search is over. And so we are over, for the most part, of saying his name. Uh, this is one of those things that in the society that we're in right now, some people do things for notoriety, either after the crime is committed or after their death. And we are making a conscious decision here at CBS2 not to report his name ad nauseum. When there is a court date, when there is major news on the case file, um, we will, of course, say the name as warranted. But right now, we are want to explain, kind of show our math here as to why we had his name and his picture up kind of wall to wall. And now we've taken it down because of that exact uh, reason that we've heard, unfortunately, so many times in this country with, with um, mass shooters. Yeah. Absolutely. That is our stance here at CBS2, and we just want to make sure that you're aware of it. Irv, um, if you could, I know that we've been with, you've been with us off and on um, for several hours here, and we've seen this unfold since 1015 this morning, and I know um, from your perspective of being both on the defense side and the prosecution and just understanding the justice system and uh, uh, investigations in general, is there anything about this that has surprised you? I know it seems that law enforcement has worked quickly. They set up the perimeter. They identify find a suspect. They got that out to the media. They apprehended him. Is there anything about the situation that you find unique or it, has this played out the way that you would expect? You know, this is the way you would hope that it would play out. And unfortunately, as you know, this is not the way that it usually does play out. It's, uh, you know, you had a very well-trained police department. You had a very well-trained hospital system that was prepared for what went on. Um, you had the uh, federal authorities, the state authorities uh, working together. Um, and I have to tell you, I live up in the northern suburbs and all the local jurisdictions contributed not only their police officers, but their fire departments and, and paramedics. Uh, to the scene. It, it, this was the way it was supposed to work. It worked out well, and hopefully uh, we have a result that will end up uh, with justice being served for these families. So let's play the what's next to your game, Irv. Um, charges expected, you say, in the next 48 hours. Um, when do you think that would come, and when might he be first in front of the judge? You know, it, it depends. Uh, they have time to complete this investigation. Uh, um, what comes next is uh, if they did not get a search warrant already for this car that you're looking at right now, they will get a search warrant to, to search this car to see if there's any uh, evidence in that uh, vehicle, such as a weapon or any type of written documentation where he expl might be explaining his motive. Um, you will also have him being brought to the Highland Park Police Department for interrogation because under the law, um, um, when a person is arrested for a homicide such as this, uh, their, their statements from the time they are arrested in the station to the time that they go to court should be videotaped. So there's no question that there's no uh, question about his, his physical safety or any improper police activity may have led uh, to any confession that may occur in a particular case. Uh, the Lake County State's Attorney's Office will uh, send representatives over there. They have the ultimate decision-making uh, process uh, in place to determine whether or not uh, murder charges or any other felony charges for that matter should be filed. Once they are approved, charges approved, the next step is to go to bond court, which will be in Waukegan uh, either tomorrow or possibly if they haven't made the decision yet uh, the following day. So, Irv, you were talking about the fact that addition, in addition to the murder charges, there could be other charges involved, other felonies. So if we're talking about, obviously, he could get life in prison, like you were saying, under Illinois law and the potential for the, the feds to step in and give some additional charges that in some scenario could lead to the death penalty. But if we're talking about six people dead, at least two dozen injured, and while we don't know his motive or how he decided to 
target this crowd. What do you think the range of additional charges could be and what impact could that have on um, this individual? The other charges uh, will be a violation of the state gun statutes. Uh, um, and, you know, those are frankly in question these days uh, based upon the Supreme Court's recent ruling regarding guns. But um, aggravated and lawful use of weapons, I believe, will be a charge that uh, will be placed. Um, and obviously, uh, what typically happens is when you go to court for the first time, the prosecutor typically charges just the most serious offenses. In this case, obviously, it's six counts of first degree murder. Um, the people that were shot um, could end up uh, having charges with respect to their cases ranging from attempted murder, attempted first degree murder or aggravated battery with a firearm both all those are serious offenses but those typically would be charged uh, after the bond court uh, appearance but frankly uh, they may just decide to throw it all in at the bond court hearing uh, within the next day or two and of course cbs2 will be following that all along the way irv miller cbs2 legal analyst and also thanks to phil andrew appreciate your insight and of course uh, we may be calling on you before the evening's up one more time irv thanks very much